Welcome, dear friends, to the service for Sunday, the 28th of July, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. And I do pray that we will be blessed as we share in this time together. In our parish, the birthday is this coming week, on the 3rd of August, Karabo Selepe. We do wish you a very happy birthday and pray that the year ahead will be truly blessed. The Lord be with you. Praise the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, 
receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let us confess our sins, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with our neighbour. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon our sins and set us free from them, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for the Tenth Sunday after Pentecost. Let us pray. Generous God, you nourish us with the words of life and the bread of blessing. Strengthen us to live confidently in your goodness, facing our fears and sharing our bread. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading this morning is taken from the second book of Samuel, chapter 11, reading from verse 1 to 15, and it's entitled David and Bathsheba. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab uh, said, sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants, and did not go down to his house. When David was told, 
Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. In the evening Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line, where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him, so he will be struck down and die. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 14 The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They have all become vile and abominable in their doings. There is not one that does good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any who would act wisely and seek after God. But they have all turned out of the way. They have all alike become corrupt. There is none that does good. No, not one. Are all the evildoers devoid of understanding, who eat up my people as men eat bread and do not pray to the Lord? They shall be struck with terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. Though they frustrate the poor man in his hopes, surely the Lord is his refuge. O that deliverance for Israel might come forth from Zion! When the Lord turns against the fortunes of his people, then shall Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is taken from Ephesians 3 reading from verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the sixth chapter of St. John, beginning at the first verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Some time after this, Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It is also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd of people followed him. They had seen the signs he had done by healing ill people. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside. There he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. 
Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him. So he said to Philip, Where can we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test Philip. He already knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Suppose we were able to buy enough bread for each person to have just a bite. That would take more than half a year's pay. Another of his disciples spoke up. It was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He said, Here is a boy with five small loaves of barley bread. He also has two small fish. But how far will that go in such a large crowd? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Then Jesus took out the loaves and gave thanks. He handed out the bread to those who were seated. He gave them as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When all of them had enough to eat, Jesus spoke to his disciples. Gather the leftover pieces, he said. Don't waste anything. So they gathered what was left over from the five barley loaves. They filled twelve baskets with the pieces left by those who had eaten. The people saw the sign that Jesus did. Then they began to say, This must be the prophet who is supposed to come into the world. But Jesus knew that they planned to come and force him to be their king. So he went away again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the Sea of Galilee. There they got into a boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. By now it was dark. Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the water became rough. They rode about three or four miles. Then they saw Jesus coming towards the boat. He was walking on the water. They were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they agreed to take him into the boat. Right away the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Last week I spoke about Paul's plea for unity in the church, the body of Christ. I spoke of the divisions that we so easily create and the walls that we so quickly build to separate us from the other. Today we continue in our journey through Ephesians and come to the most beautiful prayer that Paul prays for the church in Ephesus. We read this morning, For this reason I kneel before the Father. What is the reason? Well, the reason for Paul's prayer is that an incredibly special process has begun in the world through this unique new organism called the Church, the Body of Christ. And Paul is actually praying that the Church would be strengthened for the task that lay ahead. The process, well, this is what we looked at last week. The process is one of breaking down barriers, removing roadblocks, flattening fences, bringing harmony and unity to a world that is sadly out of tune. In the verses preceding the ones we read this morning, the Apostle has noted the particular division of his own culture, that between Jew and Gentile. It was a society in which the ethnic divide was as deep and wide as has ever existed between races in our own day. In fact, 
It is said that the Jewish morning prayer included thanks to God for not being a Gentile. There was the deeply held belief that Gentiles were not much more than fuel for the fires of hell. And Gentiles thought no more highly of Jews. Wow, some serious stuff. Paul says that these divisions are being overcome in Christ in the body of believers. We all know that we live in a world that is often defined by its divisions. This call to unity that we see in Paul's letter is an important one, and it emphasizes both, both the work of the Lord Jesus, together with the Holy Spirit and the Church, or the body of Christ, this new creation. In this sense, unity can only be reached by living the virtues of humility, gentleness, patience, and peace. We need to understand that the underlying character of unity is the very person of Jesus, that living word of God, the head of the body, the cornerstone of the building, and the Lord of the church. This unity is further maintained and strengthened by the gifts that God gives each member of the body, and all members of the body are needed. We cannot do this alone. This reminds me of when I was working in forestry and uh, before I uh, went through to college, I did a practical on Hogsback Plantation, a really beautiful area of our country. And on the plantation, there was this beautiful arboretum, which contained many unusual species of tree that we don't normally find. One of these trees was the Sequoia sempervirens, or the Californian or coastal redwood. These are huge trees that grow to incredible sizes, and actually the highest is found in California and is named Hyperion. It is over 115 meters high and estimated at between 600 and 800 years old. When I think about these trees, I assume they must have a massive root system that reaches almost to the center of the earth. A severe storm or a tornado could easily blow over an entire redwood forest if it lacked a strong root system. But redwood trees have very unique roots that are actually just two to four meters deep. You see their roots are very shallow but incredibly wide. So how do they stay standing during a tumultuous storm? Well, they're actually able to withstand significant wind because they intertwine their roots with the other redwood trees that are nearby. Their roots are all connected and they are literally holding each other up. They ultimately intertwine their roots so they can share nutrients and physically support each other. So just below the ground is a massive interconnected support system. These roots function as hands that have linked together to hold each other up during tough times. This also means that when a redwood tree stands alone, there is a much greater risk of instability and being blown down in a storm because there are no supporting roots from other trees around it. If you want to build something that will last, a symbol of strength, then your roots will be a key to your success and longevity. From this, we too can be reminded that our roots matter. When we choose to be intentional about who we plant ourselves next to, we are being purposeful about the community that we are building. I think that's the way it should be with us as believers. We need to be knit together in love to grow strong to be stable and to be able to stand as people of faith. God has established the forest, which we call the church, in which we are to grow. We sink our roots into the local body and become entwined with each other's lives. Then when the storms of life start blowing, we too are stabilized and able to withstand the winds of affliction, temptation or persecution. To stand tall in our faith, means we must have strong roots. Paul told the church at Ephesus that they should be rooted and grounded in love. Like the redwood trees, our faith will be stronger when we are tangled with others in close proximity. The problem, however, is that in our society, faith has become a very private matter. 
People rarely discuss their religion and almost never share individual experiences that affect the way they believe. In fact, it has almost become taboo to talk about our faith, our lives in the church, or how we see God working in the world. But, like the great redwood trees, without entangled roots, without sharing our stories and engaging with fellow Christians, we won't last long especially when we face difficulties or crises. To be grounded in love is to accept God's unconditional love and have a relationship with others who have faith. The more our roots are entangled with the roots of others who have faith, the stronger our faith will be. You see, it's not enough just to be a member of the church or identify with some denomination or building. We need to share our stories, both the good and the difficult. We need to develop relationships with others whose lives also have a connection to the community of faith. It is strong relationships which enable us to endure, not the church as an institution. Paul was speaking to people who had no church structure. The temple was in ruins. They had no sacred altar or any sacred artifacts to use as a centerpiece for their worship. They only had each other. Paul was also striving to bring both Jews and Gentiles together. Being grounded in love would require people of different traditions to be together, loving one another instead of competing with one another, overlooking those glaring differences. To be grounded in love means we must be willing to reach beyond our families and our familiar neighborhood and embrace people who are strangers. It's not sameness or oneness that will make us strong, a strong community of faith, but rather diversity, people of diverse backgrounds and faith journeys coming together as one. I came across a lovely story. It's a story of a little boy who wanted to have a puppy. His mother told him that he would have to earn the money, and so he did all kinds of odd jobs until he finally earned enough money to buy a puppy. He went to the pet store and observed a litter of puppies in the window. He went into the store and one of the puppies lying in a corner got his attention. The store manager came over and asked if he could help. The little boy told the store manager that he wanted the puppy in the corner. But the store manager said that he should choose one of the other puppies. That one was not very healthy. He was the runt of the litter. He said he wouldn't feel right selling a puppy that was less than normal. But, the little boy insisted, Mister, he said, that little puppy needs me and I need him. The store manager replied, But I don't feel right selling you a puppy who doesn't have much of a chance. The little boy then rolled up his pants leg, revealing a brace on his leg. You see, sir, I haven't had much of a chance to be normal. That's why we need each other. Paul also said that to be grounded in love is to comprehend all the breadth, length, height and depth of the love of Christ for us. I believe he means our faith is stronger when we can realize that we are part of a bigger picture. Each of us lives in a small world our faith becomes stronger when we see ourselves as something much larger. Paul wanted his listeners to understand that they didn't live in a vacuum. They were a part of something much greater, and the love of Christ within them would reach beyond their wildest imaginations. To stand tall as people of faith like the giant redwoods in California, we need to be intertwined with others in the faith. We will also stand out as a community of faith when we include people who are different from ourselves. And hopefully, we will be a parish who can see the forest through the trees by seeing ourselves as a small, vital part of a much larger faith community. I'd like to end this morning by sharing a meditation by Henry Nouwen talking about this radical love of Christ. Jesus' primary concern was to be obedient to his Father, to live constantly in his presence, 
Only then did it become clear to him what his task was in his relationships with people. Perhaps we must continually remind ourselves that the first commandment, requiring us to love God with all our heart, all our soul and all our mind, is indeed the first. I wonder if we really believe this. It seems that in fact we live as if we should give as much of our heart, soul and mind as possible to our fellow human beings while trying hard not to forget God. At least we feel that our attention should be divided evenly between God and our neighbour. But Jesus' claim is much more radical. He asks for a single-minded commitment to God and God alone. God wants all of our heart, all of our mind and all of our soul. It is this unconditional and unreserved love for God that leads to the care for our neighbour, not as an activity that distracts us from God or competes with our attention to God, but as, as an expression of our love for God who reveals himself to us as the God of all people. It is in God that we find our neighbours and discover our responsibility to them. We might even say that only in God does our neighbour become a neighbour rather than an infringement upon our autonomy and that only in and through God does service become possible. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we have come before you today to offer our praise and adoration. You are God the Creator, giving us richly all things to enjoy. You are Christ the Saviour of the world, made flesh to set us free. O oh God, you created us and you love us as our Father. Teach us to trust you and help us all to know that you love us completely. Help us to trust that you will always answer our prayers and that we must not only ask, but also listen and look for the answer. We pray for those who hate, that they may learn to love. We pray in particular for those who suffer at the hands of others and for those whose lives and liberty is overtaken by causes which are not their own. Grant, Lord, that all people may live without fear and hatred as they walk in your ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people of faith throughout the world that aspiration to godly truth might prevail and banish the temptation in men to commit atrocities in the name of faith. We pray for the church worldwide, its unity and its message. We pray that its light may shine in this world of darkness, that all may know the true love of our Lord Jesus Christ and that we may be proud to confess that we are Christians. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for governments that they may rule with wisdom and justice and with respect for their subjects and for other nations. For the people of Ukraine, Lord, we pray for protection, courage and endurance in the face of tyranny, for hope and trust that peace will, that peace will come for the international community that it will be steadfast in supporting the territorial independence of all countries. Lord, we pray for the people of Gaza. We pray that their world of hunger, despair and loss can be turned to calm and relief through the negotiations for a ceasefire, for a lasting peace that recognizes the hurts on both sides of the conflict and for long-standing differences to be reconciled. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer in mind or body and for those who care for them. We pray for the sick and the sorrowful, for those who mourn, 
for those without faith, hope, or love. We pray for any known, anyone known to us who are in special need of our prayers at this time. We remember them now in a moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember before you, before you those who have died and those whose anniversaries fall at this time. Give strength to those who are left to grieve and help us to share in each other's sorrow. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here today in your presence. As we depart from this place, we carry with us the mystery and joy of the Holy Trinity. We are grateful for the love, grace, and communion we experience. Guide our steps as we go forth into the world and may we reflect your love and unity in all our actions, spreading your message of salvation and grace to those we encounter. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come now to the celebration of the Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfilment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you, and so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of the evil one and banish the darkness of sin and death. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Who in the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we bring before you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honour are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
The bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, give us your peace. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Draw near and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. The body of Christ broken for us. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for us. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious. His mercy endures forever. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for keeping us by your grace in the body of your Son, the company of all faithful people. Help us to persevere as living members of that holy fellowship, and to grow in love and obedience according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God bless Africa, protect our children, transform our leaders, heal our communities, restore our dignity, and give us peace for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, remain with us now and always. Amen. So dear friends, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his 
his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in him he stands No tongue can bid me this depart No tongue can bid me this depart When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because a sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied To look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me. Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God Alleluia Alleluia Praise the one risen Son Oh